was the victory over Reconstruction. Sunday at 4 p.m. on Real America, the 1944 World War II propaganda film on the North Africa campaign. The President of the United States welcomed the Prime Minister of Great Britain. The gravity of the moment had brought them together. And at 8 on the presidency, Alexandra Zapruder talks about her book, 26 Seconds, a personal history of the Zapruder film. Gradually, starting in the six, late 60s, versions of the film began to leak out and people began to see it. And when they saw it, because of the way that the film looks, it did not look like what the Warren Commission concluded. American History TV, all weekend, every weekend, only on C-SPAN 3. Washington Journal continues. And joining us now from New York City is Christopher Glazek. He is a contributor to Esquire magazine, and he's here as part of our Spotlight on Magazine series to talk about his recent investigation into the family behind OxyContin and how they are profiting from the opioid crisis. Christopher, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Kimberly. So tell us what made you look into this particular aspect of the opioid crisis. Right. So you know, I, I write about public health, and I've been interested in the opioid epidemic for some time. Um, there was this amazing investigative series in the Los Angeles Times last year that looked into OxyContin and the company that manufactured it, Purdue Pharma. And that series uh, kind of glancingly referred to the fact that there's actually one family that owns 100 percent of Purdue Pharma and reaps the billions from OxyContin. Okay. Uh, and, and, and that was shocking to me. I didn't realize that there was a single family that stood behind the drug. Okay, and, and you, this family, the Sackler family, uh, the name may sound familiar to viewers, uh, to, particularly in the, uh, in the cultural world, uh, lots of museums uh, with that name on it. Tell us who this family is. Absolutely. So, so the Sacklers are among the very most significant uh, philanthropists in the world. They, they give millions and millions of dollars to the arts and higher education. If you've been to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, if you've been to the Louvre in Paris, if you've been to the Tate in uh, England, um, it, the Guggenheim, the Natural History Museum, uh, the Brooklyn Museum, it really, you know, almost all of the, the most important museums in the world have a Sackler wing or a room name for the Sackler or some significant Sackler donation. Uh, the same is true if you look at higher education. There's Sackler institutes at almost every Ivy League school. There are Sackler professors uh, that are named at, at you know, many of the nation's top schools, uh, Yale, uh, Columbia, NYU, Caltech, uh, et cetera. And so, so go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut yeah. you off. Go ahead. Oh, no. So, so, you know, so I, I was aware of the Sackler name, and, and the Sacklers are extremely public about some things. They're extremely public about their donations, but they're incredibly private about the source of their fortune and about their business. And talk a little bit about that business and the connection between uh, the maker of OxyContin. Right. So, so, so the Sacklers uh, are, are the 100% owners of Purdue Pharma, uh, and they also own a number of international companies that are linked to Purdue. That's a pharmaceutical manufacturer based in Connecticut. Um, and OxyContin is, is, you know, constitutes the overwhelming majority of, of their sales. Uh, they've, uh, the company has grossed about $35 billion from OxyContin since it was released in 1996. Um, and the Sacklers themselves have amassed a fortune of roughly $13 billion, as estimated by Forbes, uh, which might be the largest pharmaceutical fortune in recorded history. And meanwhile, uh, as we have uh, talked about a lot on this program before, there is an opioid crisis uh, in the country. Uh, you write, uh, among other things, according to the CDC, 53,000 Americans died from opioid overdoses in 2016, and more than the 36,000 who died in car crashes in 2015, or the 35,000 who died uh, from gun violence that year. Uh, so at the same time, uh, talk a little bit about the source of uh, these opioids, which includes OxyContin, and, and the way that uh, drug manufacturers and uh, manufacturer owners profit from it. 
Right. So a really important thing to understand about our current prescription drug epidemic and, and, and our current opioid epidemic is that uh, this really comes from the healthcare system. Uh, you know, for, for, for years and years and years, there was a pretty strong kind of customary taboo or stigma about prescribing powerful opioids like morphine, uh, like heroin at one time. Uh, the, it, there was a taboo against prescribing it for, for ordinary kinds of pain. What happened over time is that uh, a, a kind of, uh, uh, there was a movement to use strong, long-acting opioids in cancer care uh, for terminally ill cancer patients. And Purdue Pharma, uh, the manufacturer of OxyContin, they had another drug first in the 1980s uh, called MS Cotton. You could think of it as OxyContin's uncle. That was a time-release morphine pill. Um, what happened was the company had the idea, what if we took this pretty successful drug marketed to terminally ill cancer patients, and instead we marketed it to a huge universe of patients suffering from things like back pain, tooth aches, menstrual pain, and so they basically uh, you know, ramped up their, their Salesforce operation and started targeting this huge range of doctors. And that really built the market for opioids and got you know, thousands of Americans hooked. Uh, you know, recently, a lot of people, a lot of these people who started on prescription drugs have switched to street drugs like heroin. But the source of a lot of this addiction actually comes from the prescription drug. Okay, and we are talking to uh, Christopher Glazer about his piece in Esquire magazine called The Secretive Family, Making Billions from the Opioid Crisis as part of our Spotlight on Magazines. Uh, we have regional lines for this discussion. Those in the eastern or central time zones can call 202-748-8000. Those in the Mountain or Pacific time zones, 202-748-8001. And people who have had experience with opioids, you or your family members, we have a special line for you, 202-748-8002. Uh, and let's go to uh, uh, Lucy from Vero Beach, Florida, on our, who is calling, uh, obviously, from the East Coast. Good morning. You're on with Christopher Glazer. Yes, uh, this family... Uh, you know, I made fourteen billion dollars out of out of Cuban. Can we? And this is causes hundreds of thousand people uh, that killed and died, and the addictive also do out of Cuban. Can American people take this family to the court? This is my question. Thank you. You know, I'm sorry, I had trouble understanding the question. Uh, do we still have him there to repeat that? I think, I think, I think, we, okay, I think we lost him. But for, for the people, I think the, the gist was for the people who are affected by this, is there any recourse that they have against um, the Sackler family specifically or the company? Well, so, so the company is now really getting encircled by lawsuits. They already in 2007 uh, had to plead guilty to, to criminal charges uh, that were brought by the federal government, and they signed this, this big agreement um, where they had to pay $600 million, one of the biggest fines in pharmaceutical history. Three of their top executives went down um, and had to pay, you know, $30 some million themselves uh, and, and had to plead guilty to, to cr criminal charges also. And that was for criminally misbranding uh, a prescription drug. Basically, uh, it was determined that, that the company had, had lied about how addictive the, the drug was. So there was one big settlement already in 2007. Now there's further suits uh, that, that, you know, just in the last couple months, I mean, there have been dozens of suits filed by cities, counties, states. Um, I think it's 41 states attorney general are, are kind of banding together to, to look at this. So, so the company is really in big trouble. The question remains, though, is any of this litigation going to reach the family? And in the current uh, wave of lawsuits, there are no family members named. And back in 2007, when the company agreed to this big settlement, no family members were named in that suit either. And, and, and it was an interesting thing because it looked like all the top executives from the company went down because it was the CEO, it was the general counsel, the chief medical officer. But that guy had just been promoted to CEO pretty recently uh, during the period in which OxyContin was developed and promoted. And really, uh, when this epidemic was really born, the top executive of the company was actually a member of the Sackler family. But they stepped aside after the federal investigation started. But so it, the way that the media covered it, it looks like the top people had kind of taken the fall. Um, but in fact, uh, no members of the family were named in that suit. 
Okay, and we are talking about this uh, piece that you wrote, The Secret of Family Making Billions from the Opioid Crisis in Esquire magazine. Uh, so you mentioned early when talking about the the way that OxyContin was marketed, that its reach was broadened uh, in a sense. I want to uh, read a, a little pull out from your uh, story. It says, the family's leader have pulled off three of the great marketing triumphs of the modern era. The first is selling OxyContin. The second is promoting the Sackler name. And the third is ensuring that, as far as the public is aware, the first and the second have nothing to do with one another. To the point that you were just making, why hasn't the, the um, controversy over OxyContin specifically and the opioid crisis more generally stuck to the Sacklers at all? Well, you know, they made one really fateful decision, which is that they did not name their company after the family name. And they did not name any of their products uh, after the family name. So it's not Sackler Pharma. It's Purdue Pharma. Uh, the, the, so the, the family, uh, it was three brothers from Brooklyn who were born in the 19-teens. They, they grew up in, in a working-class family. I mean, their, their parents owned a small grocery store. And um, they got their start first in, in pharmaceutical advertising. And, and the patriarch of the family, Arthur Sackler, actually... Uh, uh, was most famous for devising the marketing campaign for Valium uh, in the 60s. And he actually made Valium the most widely prescribed drug in the United States, another highly addictive drug, in that case, a, a benzo. Um, and, and it's interesting, what he did with Valium is somewhat similar to what his younger relatives ended up doing with Oxycontin. There had already been a drug on the market called Librium, which, uh, whose effects were virtually indistinguishable from Valium. But Librium had been targeted at a narrow patient base, Arthur Sackler had the idea, what if we uh, took a similar substance but marketed it for a huge range of indications and ailments? Uh, so so it, you know, he uh, created this concept called psychic tension, which uh, kind of like what we may think of as stress. And he said, you know, psychic tension could be at the root of all kinds of physical problems. You have a headache, if you have sleep problems, if you have indigestion, sexual problems. All of those kind of physical conditions then could maybe be treated by Valium. So it became this kind of cure-all. It's very similar to what happened later with, with Oxycontin, where there had been this drug already on the market, but targeted only at terminally ill cancer patients. Uh, but then uh, the company had the idea, what if we marketed this for a huge range of conditions? Okay, and we have a, a lot of callers that are uh, waiting to ask you questions. Iris is calling from a Mechanic Station, New Jersey. You're on with Christopher Glazer. Good morning, and I uh, just want to say you guys are doing a great job. I watch you every day. Um, I have a, a problem. I have a grandson who has ADHD, and he has narcolepsy. And, and um, oh, wait, I can't hear you. Hello? No, go ahead. You're, you're on, Iris. Keep, you're on. Go ahead. Um, and uh, my daughter's having problems with the insurance company. They are refusing to give him the medication, which is Quilichu, that he needs for his condition. He is now 12, 5 feet 4. He used to uh, do um, Concerta. And he is very well tested. Uh, his doctor check checks and triple checks, and he does the brain scan every three months. Well, let me ask you. Let me ask you this, Iris: Is this is the drugs that he needs? Are are they opioid based? I don't know if you call it, but they are substance controlled. I guess he would. It's Quilichu and Concerta, and they're refusing, and I was afraid this was going to happen, that with the de deregulation, with what they're talking about doing, the insurance companies are not going to want to cover the, the necessary med uh, medication. All right, Iris, so I, I appreciate your issue, but I think it's not quite on topic on what we're talking about, which is the, the profiting off of uh, opioids like OxyContin. Uh, Christopher Glazer, if you have some insight, um, you're, you're free to weigh in. Right. Well, so I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure that the, the, the caller's case is, is exactly the same, but it does raise an issue which comes up a lot, which is that you know, there's always this uh, balancing act that has to happen between delivering medication to patients who really need it and preventing uh, addictive medication from flooding the market and, and creating all these public health problems. And that's something we struggled with with opioids for a really long time. Um, and so you have you know, these kind of very organized 
patient groups that are very concerned that with all of these headlines about the opioid epidemic killing thousands of people, it's like a thousand people every week, uh, that they're no longer going to be able to get the opioids they need. Um, and so you know, th th that's a really difficult uh, uh, problem to, to puzzle through. One thing I would say, though, um, you know, th this is, uh, there's been a real shift in, in the medical community's attitude about this. And in, in 2016, last year, the CDC issued these guidelines raising questions about whether powerful, long-acting opioids are actually appropriate for treating chronic pain longer than six weeks at all. Um, and they said there's really not very strong research that suggests that opioids are actually an effective treatment for chronic pain because they change your pain threshold. So they work really well for short periods, but if you're taking them every day, week after week, month after month, year after year, your dose has to be constantly escalating to keep up. Now, that happens to be a very profitable business model if you're selling the drug, if, if someone's taking it and they need more and more and more just to keep up. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a pretty nice uh, profit stream that you can generate there. Okay, Marianne is calling from Pittsburgh. Good morning. Hi. hi. Um, I have a question and a comment. Um, I suffer from chronic pain, and I need my pain medicine. And for you to sit up there and act like uh, you're blaming the drug makers for all these problems when you should be holding the people responsible is themselves. I, I don't go out there and look for heroin. I mean, you're, you're, I, I think you're appalling because you're saying, oh, it's everybody else's fault except for the person that actually puts a needle in their arm. I, I, I think you're wrong because you don't understand chronic pain. And if you don't have chronic pain, you do not understand it. So everybody's being punished because everybody's doing everything else with the needles. You're not saying fentanyl and heroin coming in across the border. I'll wait for your response. Sure. Well, you, you know, so 80% of heroin addicts actually started on a prescription drug. So, you, you know, the, 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 con the thought that there's some hard distinction between heroin and fentanyl on the one hand and people uh, taking drugs as prescribed for, for chronic pain on the other, the distinction is, is fuzzier than, than it might seem. Um, and you have, you know, case after case of people who are prescribed opioids that are way too strong for their condition, and they end up becoming addicts, and it ends up ruining their lives. So there's absolutely a, you know, a large group of patients who do need opioids to treat their conditions, and it's important that we, that we keep that and make it available to them. But we also need to look at the other side. Something I would say, you know, um, so obviously we, we have a tendency to, to blame addicts, and if we don't blame the addicts, then we'll often blame the doctors who prescribed it, some of whom are involved in illegal activity. Um, if we don't blame the doctor, sometimes we'll bring, blame the distributors, the people who deliver it from the manufacturer to the doctor. But what I really wanted to look at in this investigation, taking an aerial view of the whole problem, who is profiting most here? Who has the most aerial view of what is going on? Who has the most granular data about where pills are going, who is taking them, who is prescribing them? And that turns out to be the person at the very beginning of the chain. That's the manufacturer. Purdue Pharma built this market, and we are now dealing with the consequences. Okay. We have Hope calling in from Redondo Beach, California, with uh, some experience with opioid use. Go ahead, Hope. Hi. Good morning. I'm a doctor, and I'm grateful for this topic. I know that in 2000, in the middle 2000, Congress passed a adverse reaction bill, which makes these companies accountable. And I'm wondering why Congress is allowing these products to stay on the market. Well, th that's a good question. That's addressed to the FDA. Um, and, and the FDA's role in facilitating the opioid crisis is, is a big part of the story. And, and when they originally approved the application for OxyContin, they made what, you know, what seems like a number of mistakes in, in, in allowing the company to make certain claims about it. The company then went beyond the claims that the FDA allowed, um, which is the source of a lot of the litigation. But, uh, you know, so, I mean, part of the issue is what, what other callers have brought up, that there are patients who do need these drugs. And so there's a concern that if you issue, if you take them off the market entirely, if you issue blanket prohibition, that you're going to be preventing cancer patients, terminally ill patients, other kinds of patients uh, from getting the drugs that they need. 
Um, you know, other countries, though, don't seem to have this problem in the same way. The United States consumes by far the most opioids of any country in the world, something like 50 percent. We're only 5 percent of the world's population. Um, and, uh, you know, other countries have not yet had a prescription drug epidemic. That's one of the things that, that drew me to, to this article also, this investigation. Uh, Purdue and the Sackler family, which owns international companies, is now trying to do in other countries the same thing that they did here in the 90s and early 2000s. They're kind of reprising their greatest hits in terms of uh, paying doctors to give speeches on their behalf, publishing misleading studies that downplay the risk of addiction. Uh, you know, they've gotten to hot water in the United States with their marketing tactics, uh, but now they're kind of taking a lot of those same tactics and they're going to Brazil, they're going to China, they're going to Colombia. They actually uh, released a study in Colombia, or circulated a study, that suggested that 47% of the population suffered from chronic pain. 47%, that, that's half. Yeah. Uh, we're talking to Christopher Glazik and about his piece uh, in Esquire magazine about the Sackler family and uh, who owns uh, Purdue Pharma, the maker of OxyContin, and how they have profited off of this drug uh, while the opioid epidemic rages in the country. Uh, tell us a little bit, I mean, as some of our viewers have pointed out and, and some also on Twitter have pointed out, uh, the opioid crisis is much bigger than OxyContin. Uh, talk about about the, the pers how much of this uh, can be attributed to this drug and this family? And does OxyContin, is it uh, related to other, are there other drugs that are involved? I mean, talk about the other oxys, oxycodone, uh, et cetera. Well, I, I, you know, I, I was shocked in the course of doing the reporting um, how much responsibility experts do pin on this one company and on the, on the family behind it. And the issue is that you know, Purdue, through its e extraordinarily aggressive marketing, they ended up changing medical uh, taboos and medical customs uh, it, you know, in, in the country. They built this market. Then everyone else feasted on the carcass. And so now we have you know, all the other uh, big manufacturers kind of got in the game, started making their own opioids, and, and, and started. You know, they saw the profits that Purdue was making, and, and they went after it. Um, you know, th there's a, a, an interesting question. Purdue is a privately held company, very closely held, notoriously secretive. It's owned by one family, the Sackler family. They do not have to make the same kinds of regular disclosures about uh, what's going on at the company that they would have to do if they were publicly traded, if they're a big giant like Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson. And there's a question, you know, would the big boys have really... Uh, done the same kind of thing that Purdue did in the 90s if Purdue had not paved the way was the fact that, you know, this was they were a run, one trick pony. All they have is this drug. Um, they're privately held. They don't have to disclose certain things that enable them to be more aggressive, to take risks with regulators that maybe the other people, uh, you know, other companies would not have taken. I, I, I think it's a, it's a really good question. Um, but, you know, the broader point is that we tend to think of these big public health uh, crises as the result of these large impersonal forces that are complicated and unfold over time that are hard to understand. That's true to some extent, but that can also distract from the fact that a lot of social problems find their roots in the actions taken by individuals. And to an extraordinary degree, uh, the opioid, the prescription drug crisis in the United States, which exists nowhere else in the world, uh, in Canada to some extent, where Pfizer is all, or where uh, Purdue is also big. Um, it, you know, really does have its root in some actions taken by e executives at a particular company. We have a, a Twitter comment uh, that uh, I'll read to you and get your thoughts on. It says, we could fix a lot of family fortunes from, uh, from growing by ending foundations and other non-taxed entities. Is that a problem, part of the problem here as you see it? Well, so there, there's a question about, uh, you know, our, our culture's tendency to allow billionaires to launder their reputations through making donations to you know, and, and I think that that's um, I'm not sure that the tax exemption is, is uh, the most important uh, element of, of, of the problem there. But certainly the Sacklers have bought an enormous amount of goodwill by essentially investing their family fortune in these blue chip brands, in Yale University, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, in the Louvre. 
the culture and And, uh, you know, uh, causes like malaria and other tropical diseases um, in the 19th century. Thousands of local libraries with his name on it. But what the Sacklers had done the church. Sitting here watching this about Oxycontin. And then years ago, I was prescribed Oxycontin for pain. They didn't try me on anything weaker. They just throwed me on Oxycontin, which I got addicted to. It. And over the years, you know, I have it like the other lady. You really can't stand someone's pain unless you're living it. But I got off of the Oxycontin by the way of methadone treatment. Now, now I'm stuck there. Go ahead, Chris. Well, it, it's a great question, and, and you know, another really wrenching is that trajectory and I got diagnosed with something called interstitial excruciatingly pelvic disease that Um, and I don't know where everybody's getting their patients that have been hearings and the interstitial society because when somebody deals with 
uh, chronic pain, there's a certain amount you can distract yourself from it, but when it becomes above a level four or five or whatever somebody's personal level is, it does become a terminal illness and it started affecting i ended up getting gallbladder disease and gastroenteritis you know, i was a picture of health for the first 29 years all right karen i want to we only have a, a little bit of time left with christopher i want to give him a chance to respond to you well i'm, I'm so sorry to hear about about uh the, the callers the prob medical problems and, you know, I, I just would like to reiterate that opioids are an effective treatment for a lot of people in a lot of situations. And it is important that patients who need the drug get the drug. The issue we have is that when you, uh, you know, with the medical system in this country, when you connect the profit motive to a highly addictive medication, the opportunities and incentives to overprescribe are so great that it ends up creating the kind of problems like we've had with the, with the opioid epidemic. You know, more than 200,000 people have died from opioid overdoses. And at the same time, you have pharmaceutical companies uh, essentially you know, giving money to doctors uh, it, it, you know, it, and, and giving money to, to pharmacists, to distributors. There's a very sophisticated system for incentivizing each part of the chain to prescribe more and more and more and more. So, you know, other countries don't have the prescription drug crisis that we do in this country. And that has a lot to do, almost everything to do with the profit motive from manufacturers. OK, Christopher Glazik, we thank you for joining us today to talk about your story, a story where uh, our viewers our, our viewers can find it on Esquire.com. You can also find Christopher on uh, Twitter at C Glazik, S-E-E Glazik. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. And coming up, we will be taking more of your phone calls. Again, Democrats can call 202-748-8000, Republicans 202-748-8001, and Independents 202-748-2002. But first, this week, newsmakers interviewed Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. He talked with reporters about the president's proposed border wall and what's happening with immigration at the border. Here's some of the interview airing tomorrow at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. I'm curious, what do you think would happen to the economy of Texas if you succeed in your agenda of chasing out everybody who is in that state working without a visa? Well, I mean, the goal isn't necessarily to chase everybody out. The goal is to, to secure the border. And what I've said is, I don't know if the wall is, is something that goes across the entire border. What I want them to do is look at the most effective means of preventing illegal immigration, largely first from a safety standpoint, because I don't want terrorists coming in their country. But two, you know, people ought to come here illegally. So a wall is probably a good idea in certain places. El Paso has a fence. Um, and as you know, that El Paso borders Juarez, Mexico. And before they put that fence up under, in the Bush administration, uh, El Paso had one of the highest crime rates in the nation. Since that fence went up, went up, they are one of the safest cities. And so there's no reason not to put up a fence, a wall in some places, if it provides that kind of safety to our citizens. What is the status of um, South Americans, Mexicans trying to cross illegally into Texas? We saw an uptick uh, under the Obama administration. What has been happening recently? And what kind of situation is it putting Customs and Border Protection into? Um, there, I saw one report where they're having to catch and release because the, the detention beds are full. So um, immigration, illegal immigration is significantly down. I think that's largely because the message from, from the president has been very strong and good. I've had the opportunity to meet with border security, border patrol, customs and enforcement, local police departments um, numerous times, and they're all very excited to be able to do their job because under the Obama administration, they were basically not allowed to, to, to enforce the law. They were just letting people in. And so I think that's the reason you're seeing the numbers come down. One is the message. You know, people know now you, you, come, you come, you're going to be arrested and sent back. And so, you know, it, it works. It, if you let these people do their jobs, if you let Border Patrol and Customs and Enforcement and our local people do their jobs, we're actually successful in preventing a lot of illegal immigration and protecting our citizens. So you're not seeing mig more migration? No, we're, uh, it's way down, significantly down since Trump came into office. He's done more for illegal immigration than I know of any president we've ever had. Washington Journal continues.
And we are taking your calls this segment on open phones. Democrats 202 748 Republicans 202 748 and Independents 202 748 uh, Getting, uh, waiting to hear what's on your mind. And we will look at some headlines uh, in uh, papers across the country, care of the museum. Uh, in the meantime, Chattanooga Times Free Press. Uh, in Tennessee uh, focuses on the allegations uh, that are creating a divide among Republican women. Uh, Yet Roy Moore, the Alabama uh, Senate candidate, his wife has remained a staunch defender that takes the front and center spot in that paper. Uh, In the American news from Aberdeen, South Dakota, says wherever the oil is, it's our responsibility. That's a TransCanada official there uh, responding after a a leak of more than 200,000 gallons of oil uh, from the Keystone Pipeline there. Uh, The Grand Rapids Press in Michigan uh, has a week in photos, which includes some of the biggest news stories of the week, including the president's trip to Asia, uh, the controversy over UCLA basketball players shoplifting, as well as Senator Bob Menendez's mistrial and uh, the sexual misconduct allegations against Roy Moore and Senator Al Franken. Uh, And finally, the Houston Chronicle, the top of the headline there, Harvey Aid tests officials' patience. The governor is saying uh, that the $44 billion request is wholly inadequate to to, uh, help the folks who are still suffering from the effects of Hurricane Harvey there. Stephen's on the line uh, from Connecticut on our independent line. Hi, Stephen. Hi, I just want to, you know, I, I follow a lot of these military campaigns. Uh, I just want to point out, to, because there's something really not in the news. Um, one battle was in Afghanistan, and it was with the United States Air Force, and, and this one was a U.S. Army-led operation, and it was a gunship called Spooky 43. And these guys fired so many shells in a Taliban ambush that they ambushed the U.S. Army troops that they called in this gunship. They, they thought the gunship was going to blow up. That, that's one battle that was really historic. I wanted to point that out. Another one is the, the, the victory in Raqqa by a really unknown U.S. Marine Corps artillery unit. They're called 1st Battalion, 10th Marines. These guys fired so many... Uh, howitzers uh, shells out of their artillery. Two howitzers burnt out. I mean, I don't think that's happened since Korea. Uh, one general quoted that, that this particular Marine Corps artillery unit uh, killed more ISIS member, uh, members than anybody in uh, even U.S. Army Special Forces in this battle against Raqqa. And I just want to note that, you know, having Brown troops makes a difference. You know, these, uh, especially in in this ISIS campaign in the Middle East, you know, these, a lot of these were connected right to uh, terrorist attacks in Paris and Brussels, just clear connections, you know, uh, slavery of women, uh, child soldiers. These are very definitively evil people. And so I want to bring note that, that these two uh, battles are, are very historic. And if I had my way, I would, I would bring them forward. And this is my way of doing it for special recognition because it's totally underrated units. And um, I'm so proud of my guys out there. Okay. Right. Cornelia is calling in from uh, Cottonwood, Idaho, on our Republican line. What's on your mind today? Hi. Oh, good morning. I just wanted to uh, kind of tie in with the last program, and I really commend this Christopher Glazek for his research and investigation, and I hope he continues to do that, because I think overall we have problems with corruption between the FDA and the pharmaceutical companies in general, and To my dismay, I heard that one of the Idaho senators took a $500,000 donation from a prescription company. Now, I don't know this for sure. I just heard it. But there's other senators, like Dick Durbin is a big one that takes all kinds of donations 
from prescription companies, and I think that needs to be looked at. Where these donations are coming from to these political parties and individuals in the parties, because I think it affects both sides of the political spectrum. And, you know, it didn't used to be that prescription drugs could be advertised on TV. And now they just have one prescription drug advertisement on TV after another, which encourages people to beg their doctors for these prescriptions. And there are natural ways of treating pain. For instance, vitamin D is just overlooked, and people should be tested for vitamin D levels because just plain old vitamin D, which is dirt cheap, you can buy it over the counter, is very, very effective for at least some kinds of ailments and pain that is just not looked into because there's no real lucrative business okay. for vitamin Okay, and in a programming note, this weekend, uh, C-SPAN Cities Tour uh, takes you to Burlington, Vermont, as we explore its history and literary scene. Today at 6.30 p.m. on Book TV, all of our nonfiction book program will air together in one block, including author Will Willard Stern Randall on the War of 1812. A lot of people ha have misconceptions about the War of 1812. Uh, they think that it was all about the Star Spangled Banner and uh, the British attack on Washington and that it was not very important, like a, a hiccup in, in history. And it really wasn't just a War of 1812. It was the end of the American Revolution that had been going on since July 4th, 1776. But there had been a long struggle with the British over trade and and rights, and um, the British wanted basically to, to take us back. So it's much more important than the way it's taught in school. And again, that is our C-SPAN Cities Tour. You can catch this and all of our Cities Tour programming at cspan.org slash cities tour. And Annie's calling in from New York City on our Democratic line, or Anne, sorry about that. <laughs> What's on your mind today? Uh, yes, I was going to say Roy Moore should take a, a, a lie detector test. He could prove his innocence, and there's no reason for the women to take a lie detector test because they would gain nothing. They can't go into civil court and get anything from him. But he has everything to gain if he wanted to prove his innocence by simply taking a lie detector test. Okay. Um, and in some other headlines this morning from Axios, uh, there is a report that the war on ISIS is killing 31 times more civilians than uh, originally claimed. It says the U.S.-led war uh, against ISIS is claiming civilian lives at a rate 31 times higher than previously acknowledged by the coalition, according to Azmat Khan and Anan Gopal, uh, New York Times reporters who conducted an 18-month investigation. It says this staggering number of deaths, quote, is such a distance from official claims in terms of civilian deaths that it may be the least transparent war in recent American history, the New York Times reported. Uh, it says that the, uh, the coalition claims that one civilian is claimed is killed in every 157 airstrikes, but on their on-the-ground analysis, it showed that one civilian is killed in every five airstrikes. Mimi is calling uh, from Collegeville, Pennsylvania, on our independent line. What's on your mind, Mimi? Yeah, I'd like to uh, offer a, a suggestion for the sexual harassment abatement, uh, and that would be to get together uh, progressive and conservative and evangelical groups to put out a report card on uh, commercial firms and various government firms uh, and give them a score on how they deal with sexual harassment. You know, give them a 10, give them a zero, and uh, see whether we can put some pressure on them by shaming them instead of the women who are shamed into silence. Maybe it's just a question. Is there any concern about how accurate that gauge might be, considering how many women have said they were discouraged for so long uh, for reporting sexual harassment for fear of uh, backlash from their employers or from the public? Oh, sure. Yeah, I thought about that, too. And I think we should offer a kind of a liberty medal for women on coming forward, you know, some kind of a, a reward for women who 
are co- courageous in that. I, I saw the, the bit about Sally Quinn coming forward about her uh, complaints about, uh, I think it's John Tower, who was up for Secretary of Defense, and uh, Nancy Castlebaum cast a negative vote because she had heard about this story. So we got to get out there and give give we got to get a reward. Let's let's give a li- a, liber- a freedom medal to women who come forward All right. and who's. All right, and we are taking calls from our viewers again, Democrats 202-748-8000, Republicans 202-748-8001, and Independents 202-748-8002. Jim is calling uh, from Pearl River, New York, on our Democratic line. Good morning. Hi, good morning. How are you doing? Talking about the uh, tax package, um, which now, of course, is before the Senate, and the concept of bringing these corporate dollars, which are offshore, have been earned offshore back, there should be a provision that they cannot, the corporations, if they receive the monies back in the U.S. at reduced taxable amounts, they should not be allowed to buy their own stock back. They probably should not be allowed to uh, pay down debt. They should be uh, channeled or encouraged or forced to use money for new projects. If, t- if you're buying back your stock, you're basically not finding anything else better to invest into, and it's just a negative force. It would accomplish nothing certainly would not help the economy. All right. And in some other headlines today, uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, is reporting that uh, lawmakers are sparring over disaster relief. It says, well, lawmakers from both parties said the White House's latest request for emergency disaster relief funds falls far short of what is needed to recover from this year's devastating storms and brace for a political fight over how to pay for it. In its funding request Friday, it's uh, third to date, the White House asked for $44 billion in, Amer- in emergency disaster relief and suggested trimming the federal spending by $57 billion to offset the cost, says uh, bold, uh, Budget Director Mick Mulvaney said in a letter to congressional leaders that the White House would like uh, would be requesting additional funds later to help Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands recover from Hurricane Maria, but that more time is needed to assess the damage there. Jeff is calling in from Florida on our Democratic line. Good morning. Yes, I was calling about the the ban on the importing trophies of dead elephants into the country. Um, I wondered who got hold of Trump's ear and if his two sons had any any uh, input on allowing it to be um, overturned. And what do you think, Jeff? Do you think that the president should have backed off of that uh, that proposal? Oh, absolutely. Um, everything I've, I've read on the numbers of elephants and how they're decimated, this is a terrible ruling. And two very unstable countries that they say they allow them because they will help support the elephants that are, are left. But I don't see the money being funneled in that direction at all. And again, that tweet from Donald Trump last night, uh, he said, put big game trophy decision on hold until such time as I review all conservation facts under study for years. We'll update soon with Secretary Zinke. Thank you. Sergio is calling from North Carolina on our Republican line as we continue to take uh, calls on open lines for the rest of the show. Good morning, Sergio. Good morning. Yes, uh, what I wanted to say is that they only talk about the high class people and the middle class people. What about the people that only makes, uh, they only get 8000 a month to live off, you know, 1000 uh, 8000 a a year to live off, you know. I don't understand it. Why? And then they want to take off Medicaid and make us pay. How can we pay with eight thousand dollars a year of living? And we already paid. Uh, we already worked thirty some years of our life paying taxes to all these Republicans. And these people, they they don't they can't get fired. They got laws that they can't get fired. They should get fired for being in there eight years. They don't never get nothing done. They just talk and talk and fight against each other and never do nothing. I mean. What's the deal? We, there should be somebody that uh, all the American people should get together and go out there and fire all these guys and put new people in there because they're too old. They don't got no no good ideas. 
They don't got nothing. They they just talk and talk. We need people, smart people in the government, not stupid people like all these old people. They're too old. They don't have nothing. They're they're back in the 30th century. They're they're you know they're too old. Okay. They got stupid. All right. And in other headlines today in the Washington Post, it says uh, the Puerto Rico utility chief has quit amid the crisis there. It says the executive director of the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority resigned Friday amid questions about slow repairs more than eight weeks after Hurricane Maria destroyed much of the electrical grid. It says prep ahead Ricardo Ramos Rodriguez had been questioned about a $300 million contract signed with the tiny whitefish energy firm instead of one of the larger, more experienced utilities that traditionally rushed to aid storm-ravaged areas. The whitefish energy contract, in which, uh, in which rates were substantially higher than those paid to others, was later canceled. Puerto Rico Governor uh, Ricardo Rossello uh, announced the resignation, saying Ramos's tenure had become, quote, unsustainable. Uh, Charlie is on the line calling from Westlake, Ohio, on a Republican line. Hi, Charlie. Hi there. I love your show. Um, my question is, statistically, when people were just getting their opiate painkillers and the doctors weren't getting in trouble, were there people ODing at the rate that they are now? Or has doctors being cut, uh, you know, being punished for giving out opiates, has that increased the death? And also... I was looking at uh, police action. When police pull people over for DUIs, if someone's on an opiate, they can't tell. So is that attracting people to take opiates to get away from the drunk driving thing? Is there a statistic that bears that out? And uh, hopefully maybe some of other callers who uh, have some of that uh, information. Unfortunately, Christopher Glasick isn't with us anymore, but maybe somebody can shed some light on that as we go to Devin, who's on our independent line from Washington, D.C. Good morning. Good morning. See, I'm, I was falling asleep last night. It was like 2 in the morning watching C-SPAN and a hearing that was convened by Senator Corker to discuss um, the first strike, taking a nuclear first strike. Uh, how does the process work? You know, what stops are in place to keep, um, you know, the president from firing off a, a nuclear missile without the consent and um, informed consent of Congress. So it was really alarming when they got to the point they were talking about, I'm not sure who it was, McMaster, maybe, but if I heard them right, there were discussions last year um or earlier this year, rather, to uh, initiate a nuclear first strike on North Korea. And I was just floored that I haven't heard more about that. And so now I'm going to have to go back to the archives and watch that C-SPAN episode again, that, that Corker hearing on nuclear first strike capability. But I think it's something we need to pay more attention to right away. All right, and that was a Foreign Relation Committee hearing earlier this week about nuclear strike authority uh, for the first time in several decades that lawmakers have looked into the possibility uh, of uh, restricting the president's ability to make that uh, first strike. And that, uh, as you know, it, and all uh, other previous hearings, you can be found in our C-SPAN archives on cspan.org. Uh, and in other headlines today from The Hill, reports that uh, if you'd like, you can own a piece of the wedding cake from President Trump and First Lady Melania Trump's wedding. It says a souvenir wedding cake from President Trump and First Lady Melania's wedding is up for auction. Julian's auction in Los Angeles is expecting the piece to sell from between $1,000 and $2,000, according, uh, according uh, well, it says the piece is up for auction. Uh, it's a chocolate truffle cake that was a take-home souvenir from the wedding in Palm Beach in 2005. According to the auction item description, the actual wedding cake, which reportedly cost over $50,000, was a seven-tier cake that contained too much wire for guests to consume. Uh, Jim is calling from Dublin, Ohio, on our Republican line. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, we found this morning that uh, C-SPAN is once again uh, been uh, hacked by the uh, ability of uh, a couple of days ago, uh, somebody suggested a, uh, a, a individual, Chuck, who would be on today to explain how the tax uh, bill is uh, going to affect people. 
Chuck uh, explained uh, what happens to uh, your uh, taxes and where they go, but here he is. He is a, uh, a an associate of uh, the former Representative Daschle, a Democrat, of course, and so he crafted the whole uh, morning about where the taxes go, but he failed to uh, uh, include, and so did uh, Greta the other morning, when she gave their address twice, but didn't give the government address. Do you know, and have you given what the government says, you know, the .gov address for where your taxes go? Also, Chuck went on to explain that, gee whiz, 